All right, there we go. Um, hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly. All right, so this time around the resolutions actually work. That is so weird. It is just, I think it kind of is working randomly. It's like sometimes people complain that they cannot change resolution and the other times it just works. So I am I think it's a Twitch thing. I'm not sure why the hell is it going on. But uh, yeah, Renato, glad to hear that uh, it is actually toggleable now. So yes, um, welcome to the episode six of BXGS Weekly, the week of uh, 14th of April of 2018. We got quite a lot of things today. Um, yeah, the number of links today is <laughs> a bit crazy, but I mean, some we're just gonna go through, like some of them are um, quite short, but uh, yeah, as usual, you can find the whole list on uh, GitHub. It is under building X with JS slash BXJS minus weekly. Um, all links are there. We're happy to uh, look at that. Um, and the tabs are pretty lightweight in this case. I mean, it's mostly text, so you know, not that hard. Um, let us get started, I guess. So the first thing is the announcement from the Mozilla Hacks guys. Uh, I absolutely love their articles, as I already said more than once, I think. This time we got a sneak peek at WebAssembly Studio. So they announced uh, WebAssembly.studio, an online IDE for uh, learning and teaching a web assembly, which is uh, actually pretty damn cool. So I'm going to open it really quick here. As you can see here, let me zoom in. Uh, you can create a bunch of projects. You can build uh, stuff in C, Rust, assembly script, what, and uh, there's a hello world as, a, as well. So it's not just uh, web assembly. You can also write it like a proper uh, Rust. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that soon we're going to see a Golang thing here because Golang just uh, recently merged the WebAssembly support into master. So I'm hoping that the next version of Go they release will support WebAssembly out of the box. That will be quite amazing. But yeah, this is uh, sort of an introduction article essentially that uh, shows you how to use the IDE, what you can do with it. There are some really cool tools here. Again, you can write in C, you can write in Rust and um, there is some very neat features. So if you are interested in WebAssembly, do have a look at that article. It is pretty good. Continuing, we got a very long uh, scrolly article, Scroll to the Future from the Evil Martians uh, team. This is um, essentially all you ever wanted to know about scrolling on the web. And it is a very, very, very in-depth article. Looking at the history of scrolling, the scroll bars, how they looked over time, how Apple did scroll bars, and like, you know, if you didn't know, then on Mac, for example, the scroll bar, uh, scroll, God, God, this word is too hard. <laughs> scroll bars auto hide if you don't scroll long enough, basically. And there's a look essentially how you, you know, like for example, here's the example with models. So the scroll bar disappears if you have a model in Mac again, there's some weird things. Um, scroll bar sizes are like, <laughs> this is just infuriating in my opinion. But yeah, this is kind of the things that you would deal with if you are working with scroll bars. And there is a lot of very interesting insights actually that I, for example, never knew, but you know, I didn't really work with uh, scroll that much. So I think that leaving the scroll native is the best. Just give me a second. So yeah, I think that leaving the scroll to the native handling of the browser is the best thing you can do. You might want to like animate something tied to scroll, but please don't screw up with scroll. And I think this article actually talks about that as well. So there is it's definitely a really, really in-depth article. And if you need to work with a scroll, that is a good one to read about. All right, continue. Um, we got an article called No Promise is Not a Monad. It is essentially a rant um, saying that um, technically, mathematically, right? Uh, promise is not a monad because monad is a well-defined mathematical object. And uh, this article essentially goes in depth into explanation of why exactly it's not a monad and uh, why is it a problem? And essentially laws matter, right? So. I'm guessing the guy who wrote this is a, either a mathematician or a very pedantic person, which is not a bad and you know, it's a good insight into monads. If you are not familiar with the monad term, then there will be a good um, starting point, I guess, because he does explain what is monad pretty well. 
So yes, uh, this is your sort of short insight into monads and promises, essentially. Um, you can, yes, you can write monads in JS. There are, wait a second, let me reopen that. So there is a bunch of libraries that uh, give you essentially, yeah, for example, monad.js is probably one of the most popular ones. This is uh, monads for JS, right? And um, there is a whole bunch of them. So basically those, those are like pure, mathematical monads, right? That, that like the maybe monad and all whatever you can imagine, all of them, like whatever is in functional programming or um, that not, that's the wrong way. Whatever is in functional programming languages are present in this library, right? So if, if it's monadic, then it's probably here. Um, so yes, yes, you can. All right, let us continue. This is something very, very cool. Um, an article is called Why React Needed Yet Another Animation Library Introducing React Spring. But as you might guess from the name, it is actually a new library called React Spring. I decided to put it into articles purely because it is a pretty big article explaining why the author decided to create a new library and how is it different from existing ones. And um, it is actually really, really cool. So as you can see here, there's a simple table that shows the uh, problems. And um, you either have a very nice, uh, you know, declarative and primitives, and you don't have interpolations and performance, or the other way around, right? So there's like some libraries that allow you to do both, but then, he... so he created this, um, uh, what was it React Spring, right, to essentially address all of those points. Uh, it uses React. Get, um, God damn it. Ah. Uh, why, what's the name of the function? Uh, request animation frame, that's what I wanted to say, uh, to do some very, very neat animation and the API also look very nice. So they use render props, as you might imagine, that's a new type thing, but it actually allows you for some very cool things. So if you are looking for a um, nice uh, React animation library, then do have a look at this one. It seems to be pretty amazing. Uh, especially, you know, this comparison of uh, flame charts is just insane. So it seems to be like way more optimized than React Motion and Move. And it's just, you know, th this is like crazy to look at from my perspective. <laughs> so yes, re Request Animation Frame works and gives you some nice edge. All right, um, continuing. We got uh, how to build Chrome extensions with React and Parcel. This is uh, from one of the people at FreeCodeCamp and uh, it is a pretty good article. Essentially, it's a tutorial on how to build a Chrome uh, extension using React and using Parcel as a package, ma well, package manager, right? So instead of more complicated Webpack, they went for the simpler Parcel, which is pretty nice. I mean, it works well, right? So if you ever wanted to get into the Chrome extensions and wanted to use react and didn't know how to configure packager for it, then this is a pretty good article. Right, continuing, we got an article code loading assembly web assembly modules efficiently from the Google guys. So this is Google developers website, as you can see. And uh, essentially, the article goes into the explanation of how the uh, web assembly loading works and more in depth into how the uh, streaming loading. So there's a new feature. I, I don't remember actually which, which uh, V8 added it, but basically uh, I already discussed an article that talked about it. So um, let me just explain it, right? So typically you just load the file, you take a ray buffer, you throw it into a compiler, then you instantiate the module and then you call it, right? That's it. The problem is before you actually compile and instantiate, you have to download the whole file, which is, I mean, it's a bottleneck, right? So you have to wait until download, you have to wait until it uh, converts into array buffer, compiles and so on and so forth. Um, the cool thing is that the WebAssembly now has support for streaming compilation. So what you can do is you can call the fetch and then immediately pass it into compile streaming. So that will compile the WebAssembly file as soon as the bytes come in from that fetch stream, which means that this is a very depictive graphic, which means that you can uh, effectively cut the compilation time to zero. So because it's gonna be executed in parallel to the download, there is not gonna be too much overhead. I mean, it's still there is, so if you have a very fast internet, you will still get some, but you know, you can see the efficiency, especially on the slower speeds. 
So it is a very nice introduction to it. And uh, yeah, this is basically, if you're working with WebAssembly, definitely look uh, at this API because they are very helpful in terms of performance. Okay, continuing, we got two years of functional programming JavaScript lessons learned. Um, so I really like this article because it goes into the um, couple of points like, you know, start learning functional programming with articles not tied to a particular language or libraries because functional programming is essentially the concepts and approach, not the way you write code, right? And uh, it also talks like this is probably my most favorite part, the pointless madness. So I know quite a lot of people who think that functional programming or object-oriented programming or whatever the other paradigms is the only way to write code. And if you write functional, you have to write everything functional, like, and you end up with a code like this. And then like, you know, this is the uh, extreme example, obviously, but still quite a good one. So instead of just saying like format and doing two lines of code, you would like use R, for example, and write it in a functional way, which is really hard to read. So uh, do not be the guy who goes into that extreme. So yes, functional programming is not about lambda calculus monads or whatever. It is, I mean, it's about composable functions, essentially, right? Without mutations, global state or side effects. So in my opinion, it is extremely helpful to know functional programming, but it is a bad idea to try to use it everywhere. It's like there are use cases that are good, there are use cases that are bad. And um, yeah, if you are looking into good points, good advice about functional programming, do have a look at this article. <coughs> okay, let us continue. We got uh, another article from Can See Dots that is called Compose Render Props. Um, Right, so render props has been all the hype lately and uh, this article basically goes into um, explanation of why are they good and how do you use them. Uh, again, on the example of downshift, it is the Kens library, uh, which is, I mean, it's a really great library and um, what he talks here about is very, very cool. So if you are still not familiar with um, render props and if you still don't understand why they are useful and how can they be used, do have a read through this article. It's not very long, but it does explain quite well why would you want to use them because render props are pretty awesome, uh, albeit look a bit weird at first. Okay, next article, uh, incrementally improving the DOM. Um, we already talked, uh, so the, this is by Phil Freeman and we already talked about his previous article. Um, I don't remember, quite a long time ago, a few episodes ago, there was the article called You Might Not Need Virtual DOM. So this is an expansion on it, right? And uh, again, it's a very in-depth, very technical art, or I guess conceptual article, not purely technical, but more of uh, talking about the high level concepts within the DOM and how exactly you apply it. Um, talking about how you can actually take the existing DOM and improve it, right? And um, it's so like, yeah, introduction of patches and everything incremental changes and all that kind of stuff. And um, if you are interested in the sort of very high level concepts that are, um, can improve your life essentially, then this is definitely a very interesting article to read. So it's that you won't find, I mean, there is, again, there is a link to the library in source code, but uh, the article itself doesn't really talk about anything source code wise. So it's purely the conceptual thing, but it is very interesting article and I would highly recommend that you read it. Okay, continuing, we got a um, website called JavaScript in 40 minutes. And as much as I think that name, this name is absolutely silly, um, if you ever wanted to get someone into JavaScript, or maybe you are coming from other programming language and you don't know how JavaScript works, or syntax, I guess, then this website is uh, very well made and allows you to jump in pretty quick. So you literally open the console and then, you know, you copy the stuff from here and it actually explains what it does. You can paste it, alert it, and then it will auto complete the task and um, present you with other tasks that introduce you to functions, variables, and so on and so forth. Very, uh, apologies, I'm still, uh, as you might hear, I'm still not quite well, but hey, all right, so, um, 
is a very well-made site, uh, very nice walk through the basic concepts of JavaScript. So, you know, if you, um, if you have any friends who want to get into it, do give it to them that it works pretty well. All right, continuing. Okay, this is something um, not strictly JavaScript, let's put it this way. This is a new spec from W3C. Uh, it's called Web Authentication, an API for public key credentials. And um, the discussion around this topic has actually been around for, I don't know, I've, I think I've read the first drafts like five or six years ago. That was like hell of a lot of time. This time around, it seems to be, um, it's actually a candidate recommendation, which means it's, it's essentially a release candidate, right? And um, this is an API that would allow you to use private and public key authentication in browser natively. So you would use your private key, provide your private key to the browser. Then you could paste your public key into the website and you could authenticate uh, using this, this way, right? Um, this is extremely powerful API that could solve a lot of problems like phishing uh, because you know you don't have to enter anything. It's just like if you have your private key, you can use encryption to check if everything is correct and then without actually giving up the private key, right? Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing this thing develop and to see when it's going to be added into the um, browsers because this is like if you have a native API for that, man, that is going to eliminate quite a lot of problems we have right now with security just by basically by being there. So it's kind of incredible. Okay. Um, okay. One of my <laughs> one of my tabs actually crashed. Oh yeah, this is Observable HQ. So I still um, refuse to call it just Observable because Observables are Observables. And this is a service called Observable HQ. It was made by Mike Bostock, uh, the guy who created the D3.js, which is uh, still, in my opinion, one of the best libraries, if maybe the best library for visualization. And um, this website is essentially the um, Jupyter for JavaScript, right? Or I guess for uh, client-side JavaScript. So you can create rich visualizations right in a browser and rich flows right in a browser. And this article goes uh, in depth in explaining how exactly the Observable HQ works. Some pretty interesting things here, but if you are not familiar with Observable, um, then essentially you can do something like this here, right? So this is actually visualized right in browser. This is D3.js visualization. And the cool thing is that you can see the data that it uses and you can see the code that it uses too. So um, again, if you ever use Jupyter or stuff like this, you would know exactly how it works. It is slightly differently, obviously, because it's JavaScript based, but still you can do some very fun, th uh, fun things here. And you know, if you're interested in, in uh, knowing how exactly this works, you can uh, actually have a look. And yeah, the cool thing is all of that is basically um, with source available, so you can you know just have a look at how this visualization visualizations are made. All right, uh, let us continue. The next article <coughs> is from NPM guys. It's called "Edit Used." Uh, just a second. Uh, the next article is "Attitudes to Security in JavaScript Community." This is essentially um, results of an overview of results of a survey on security within the uh, among the JavaScript developers. Um, I am kind of terrified that there are 23% of people who are trusting open source code um, and trusting that it's secure. If you do that, please don't. <laughs> don't ever trust any code uh, without any verification. And this picture is also terrifying because um, it's it's like, yeah, that's, that's actually scary. That's, that's really scary. So it's like, People are satisfied with the methods to evaluate safety of OSS. I've seen some good tools for JavaScript, but I also would say I'm not satisfied with the way that the security is tested, right? Um, it's also very interesting to see that some people are not concerned with the security of the code they write. I guess they're either inexperienced or very, um, how to put it best, very um, sure that they will be 
their code won't have any bugs. You know, I'm, I'm, every time I push something to live, I'm terrified that I will screw up somewhere and people will use my code to break into our servers and then like, you know, install miners or whatever there. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's like, it's a very interesting uh, survey, very interesting results. And I guess it comes together with the fact that um, NPM Inc. just acquired this company that does JavaScript security. So I'm thinking we're gonna see some security tools integrated into NPM JS uh, right away, right? So, I mean, not right away, but directly NPM repository will provide some security insights into your packages. That will be quite awesome. So I would love to see that. Okay, continuing. Um, the next article is write your own Node.js promise library from scratch. I am still not sure why it's called Node.js library, uh, Node.js promise library, because you can literally do that in a website. That's fine as well. Uh, I mean, in the, in the browser, obviously. But um, so the thing is, um, is if you don't understand how promises work, or if you still have problems figuring that out, um, the best way to learn is to implement your promise, right? It is... It's not a big article, it's very straightforward. And um, it basically goes through implementation of everything from then to change to, you know, whatever you can do with promises and to async await. <laughs> because Node.js is cool. I mean, fair enough, fair enough. Not be not, uh, not as cool by just saying implementing your promise library in JavaScript from scratch. That's true. Okay, that's true. That's not as catchy. <laughs> But yeah, so if you want to have a deeper understanding of promises, if you still don't get all the concepts, uh, this is a great example. This will teach you how they work. It will show you how you can build your own library. And uh, hopefully by the end of doing all of that, you will understand promises much better. All right, next thing is a sync iteration natively in Node.js. So Node 10 is coming. It is going to be released by end of this month, right? So it's quite soon, two weeks max. And it has uh, the async iteration. So what this means is that you can do cool things like, uh, like right now, for example, if we take the read stream, right? You read the file and then you have this on data, on end, which is a bit annoying and like, you know, not very nice. Well, with async iteration, you can actually just do for await chunk of read stream and you will get those chunk right away. In my opinion, this is an incredible API. So this will allow you to do some very, very cool things. And it is way easier to code and read than the stream, like native stream handling, right? Um, yeah, this article basically goes in depth on it, comparing it to the async generators and how you connect generators to the iterables and so on and so forth. As usual, the articles from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier are pretty good. So do have a read if you're interested in that topic. Okay, another article from um, Dr. Axel is understanding TypeScript type notation. So if you ever wanted to know, if you never before worked with a strictly typed language and, uh, or statically typed language, I think, um, and you don't understand what this means, it's a very good introduction to what are types, how you annotate them in TypeScript, how they work, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's pretty lengthy, but I think it goes through all the features of TypeScript, and once you read it, you will understand TypeScript much better. If you already understand what this means, then I guess you won't really find too much um, new things here, basically, right? If not, then, well, that's a good introduction to typing. Okay, um, the next article is how to escape a sync await hell. I honestly think that this is the worst possible title for it. It's very clickbaity and it doesn't really reflect the nature of the article, but the article itself is still quite good. So the idea of the article is pretty simple. Um, say you have this code, right? So you execute a bunch of things in sequential. Right, so those things are executed one after another. The thing is that sometimes you might want to do things in parallel, right? And with a sync await, you will await one thing and then a second thing, third thing, and so on and so forth. So this article goes into basically uh, talking about how could you do that in parallel, right? Which obviously the answer is promise all. So you just await up an array of promises. And uh, in this case, uh, they use the um, 
array and push promises into it. There are obviously other ways of doing it, but the core idea is that it's not always a good idea to execute everything uh, in sequential order. So you sometimes might speed up things by executing in parallel. And it's a good thing to think about that. So still hate the title, but uh, the idea is a good one. All right. Um, oh, yeah, this one is great. So this is an article called Abusing Proxies for DSLs. And essentially it talks about using a ES6 proxy that we already talked about to create your own DSL, which um, yeah, there was a terrible, oh, I think they had an example here on the spoiler, yeah. That would allow you to do fizz buzz using like this, like it, it's really hard to read, it's terrible, but it actually works, which is kind of incredible, the whole fact that you can actually do that. And um, there is a very good disclaimer here saying that writing code like this can lead to both the browser and your core workers hating you, which is absolutely true. So please don't write the code, but the exercise on its own is actually really cool. So do have a read. Uh, it gives you a lot more insight into how proxies work and what can you do with them. Um, but yes, please don't use that in your code because this is just straight up terrible. <laughs> Oh, yeah, a really cool article, really cool idea, and um, very good insights into proxies. Okay, continuing. Um, this is not exactly JavaScript related, but I just think it's a really cool way of presenting stuff. So if you are not familiar with graph theory or want a refresher, this is an interactive um, website that will guide you through it, essentially. It's built with D3GS. I think they have a source code available on GitHub. Yes, they do. And uh, you can actually, you know, have an interactive uh, graph building and actually see the whole graph representation in mathematical um, format, right? So it is really, really cool. And uh, yeah, there's like exercises and everything. So again, if you're interested in graph theory or D3GS and, and using it for building graphs, which again is something that there is a source code here for, right? You can have a look at that. And this is like, this is really, really cool. Um, can you remove, can, uh, uh, no, can you remove edges? Uh, yeah, you can, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's a pretty cool website. Okay, um, next article is introducing the accessibility inspector in the Firefox developer tools. So this is something really neat, I think. The Firefox DevTools guys added a special accessibility inspector that actually allows you to simulate different accessibility conditions like color blindness and uh, screen reader for blind people, for example, using DevTools. So you don't have, you don't need any additional special tools for that. Uh, it is for now just in Firefox nightly, but again, if you're working with accessibility things, then definitely have a look at it because it seems to be pretty damn powerful. Okay, continuing. Uh, Node.js can HTTP2 push. Uh, so, HTTP2 support has been in Node.js since Node 8, uh, since July 2017, so it's quite some time. It was behind the experimental flag and was not completely implemented, I guess. Um, so they've added the version 9 now has the push thing. And uh, if you didn't know, essentially HTTP2 allows you to do server push. So once the connection is established from the client, it can be, it's a duplex connection, right? So it's, it works, um, I wouldn't say the same way as WebSocket, but the idea is that server can actually push the data itself without any requests from client, which is a great thing. And they, they um, here's the uh, article talks about using Fastify and uh, using the push stream here to push the data from server to the client using HTTP to push which is pretty cool. And I'm really looking forward to node 10, which I am guessing is going to have um, HTTP 2 push enabled, or I guess HTTP 2 API enabled by default. There's also some um, supplementary libraries like HTTP 2 auto push that like, you know, you just basically plug it in and it will uh, do, do stuff for you, which is pretty cool. All right. Continuing, um, this is actually related to the latest release of VS Code, and I somehow missed that feature in the, in the log last time because they released so much stuff that it's really hard to track it. But the cool thing is that they've added this. Um, so in addition to breakpoints, 
you can have so-called log points where um, node will actually log whatever the line that you tag. So like, as you can see here, he says, okay, I want to log results. And then you add the log point. And when you execute the uh, um, your script using Node.js from the VS Code, obviously, you will actually see the logging results on this specific log point, which I think is really cool. So, first of all, I maybe no longer will be writing console log everywhere. I can just use log points now. Second of all, it's just a really neat feature. Uh, so yeah, this one is really small. All right, um, I have two, I guess, minor announcements. The, like, not so minor, but uh, they are really short. First one is V8 6.6 has landed on Node Master, which means that Node 10 will be coming with 6.6 which is kind of awesome because 0.6.6 uh, v8 6.6 is uh, has quite a lot of really cool things in it. And the second thing is seems like um, so Node.js 10 is scheduled for April 24th, which is actually even sooner than I expected. So 10 days left. And if everything will go according to plan, nothing breaks and RC, you know, release candidates do not break people's infrastructures, we're going to see a Node 10 by April 24th, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Okay. Um, then we have the article called list processing with map filter and reduce. So this is a quite basic article, I guess. Um, and if you are familiar with uh, list methods and array methods for JavaScript, then you won't find anything new here. But if you never used map reduce and filter and for each and other methods, this is a pretty good introduction, right? So it will tell you how you can use those functions, why you can use them, when you can use them, and so on and so forth, and what they actually do. It's pretty long. So you know, it's, it's, it's basically all you have to know about those methods. Uh, so if you are still not comfortable enough with them, do have a read through because they do give you quite a good idea of what uh, what those methods do. All right. Um, yeah, last article we have today is not exactly JavaScript. It is actually from Riot Games, the guys who develop League of Legends. And the article is called The Taxonomy of Tech Debt. I thought it's interesting because they uh, try to split the tech debt into different categories, I guess, uh, based on their own experience within the company, right? And they talk about the impact, the fixed cost, the contagion, and um, sort of the properties of each of tech debt. Like, so you have like local debt, you have uh, MacGyver debt. This is like, this is a really cool, um, what do you call it? A really cool term, I think, for, you know, like, let's just do some hack around and then fix it later. MacGyver debt is my new favorite phrase, actually. <laughs> yeah, so. It is, it is a really cool insight into what kind of depth you might expect when your project grows or if you have a large team working on something, right? Uh, really cool to read, uh, very interesting insights. Okay, now we're coming to the releases section and the first release of this week is Redux 4.0 uh, release candidate one. I um, honestly don't know what kind of changes uh, is there for version four, because it is not yet well documented. So I'm guessing that, you know, I'm not guessing it's going to be well documented when the 4.0 releases completely, they usually have amazing um, docs for that. But right now it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on. Um, but let us see, is there anything? Um, so they dropped support for Internet Explorer 11, which is, I guess, expected. And uh, yeah, basically, Redux is still relevant in case, you know, you wondered if the new um, context API will replace it. That is not likely. There's a different things for different um, problems. Um, so yeah, this is a first release. The next thing we have is Rx Explorer 2.0. This is a really neat little tool that allows you to explore RxJS. Um, and now it has even additional um, code snippets that go with the pipeline operator, which is still not released, right? So you'd have to use Black like, Babel for that. And they also use the ligature font that is, uh, I'm not a fan of, but you know, whatever people like. Um, but the cool thing is that you can actually navigate 
all the RX API here. And uh, no, that's not what I want. Um, da -da -da -da, where was the pipeline operator? Yeah, so you can actually compare different versions of Arik, navigate the API and see all this stuff in, um, even with animated Akamon. My JavaScript thing is cut all of that. And can I have a video now? Yes, so you can actually see even, you know, the animations of how the operators work within the streams of observables, which is really, really cool in my opinion. All right, um, next release we have is Prettier 1.12 uh, with a really long list of things that have been fixed, added or changed. Um, I think this is like, yeah, so this is one of my favorite things. I always felt weird when Prettier formatted nested ternaries like this. Also, you know, I try not to nest them uh, when I can, but there are sometimes cases when you kind of it's just easier to nest them once than to like rewrite it into a separate thing or something. So it's nicer that it now formats it properly. There's also like improved command handling, um, Angular stuff, and um, <clears throat> object patterns uh, and uh, breaks and nesting and all of that things, you know. So it's basically now it's even better than it was, is what I want to say. <coughs> I've been using it since it was released and Man, I'll probably be using it in, in like 10 years or something if it doesn't go away. Uh, and I hope it doesn't because it's one of my favorite tools. All right, next thing we have is React Beautiful D&D &D version 17. This is an Atlassian library for accessible drag and drop um, that is actually pretty cool. So as you can see here, you know, it works with mouse, it works with keyboard. It seems to be incredibly fast and it is now version seven. Oh no, no, I think I said 17, it was version seven, I apologize. Um, yeah, so if you ever needed a good drag and drop library, do have a look at that. This seems to be absolutely bonkers. And uh, yeah, version seven is out uh, with a lot of really um, incredible changes and uh, yeah, support for ReactSec 16.3, I guess what would be the uh, major one with 58% reduction in time, which is just insane when you think about it. All right, uh, next thing is the release of Safari 11.1, uh, which is now on a stable, so this is a stable Safari for Mac and uh, iOS. And this includes the, the major thing that it includes is actually service workers. So you can actually use them now on both the Mac OS and iOS, which is way more important. So that you can have uh, modern progressive web apps working properly there. Um, there's also other highlights, but you know, I won't go through that. If you're interested, do have a look. There's some uh, nice additions and changes there. So, you know. Okay, next interesting thing we have is the Electron 2, which I think is still uh, in beta, uh, I believe. Yes, it is in beta. Um, as a new API, which is, uh, added for in-app purchases for now, I think is just for the Mac App Store, but it is pretty cool that you can actually now have an API within the Electron natively that you can use to uh, charge users. I mean, you know, like selling stuff is always great if you can, um, like if you have a freemium business model, for example, yes, this is an amazing addition for you instead of implementing it yourself through some third party API, you cannot just use the Electron official API, which is always great. All right, um, Angular 6 is coming. I believe it is not yet released. Yeah, there's an RC2. And there is a ton of things apparently changed in it, including the latest TypeScript and so forth and so forth. But um, I won't stop here too much because I'm not using it. I'm still terrified of the number of versions they change. I guess not as much as React. <laughs> because they didn't jump from version 0. Point, uh, what was it, 0. 0.12 to 13 or whatever, but uh, yeah. Yeah, another Angular. I mean, people still use it. It seems to be a decent framework. It's just, um, I don't know, I I'm kind of got used to the React way, I guess. Okay, um, so last thing we have, I guess, um, it's not exactly a release, but uh, GitHub just celebrated 10 years. 
It's kind of insane when you think about it that 10 years ago there was no GitHub and they managed to achieve quite a lot. They also have some pretty nice, um, like, you know, outline of what happened here, like Bitcoin that was on GitHub, Node.js. Node.js was launched in 2009. Holy crap. I've been using it for a long bloody time. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is pretty cool, you know, like really, really happy for the the um, github guys and you know that the it actually works out for them and uh, they support open source community and they actually make profit and they will keep supporting it so it's really cool really cool okay now we come to the libraries section um i got quite a lot of libraries uh first one is uh from the author of polka framework that i've used at some point it's called regex param and it's a nice little library for that converts essentially roots like this into regular expressions that you can match against strings you know so uh yeah it's very straightforward very simple very tiny as usual this guy likes tiny things like 299 bytes <laughs> super small um if you're looking for something like this this is your go-to thing or should be your go-to thing uh so yeah it seems to be a pretty nice little library. Okay, continuing, we got a whole bunch of um, state libraries that are built around new context API. So first one of them is unstated. That is, as far as I understood, is typically used with um, Preact because it's quite tiny. And it has a very uh, nice API. So basically you have the container uh, class that you extend, and this is your state essentially. And then you have a subscribe component that subscribe to some state, right? And then you use render props to render whatever you want, which is, you know, works pretty well. And the cool thing is that you don't need any, first of all, you don't really need context. It actually works without context just fine. You can do it with context as well. It just simplifies API a bit, right? And, um, it allows you for some really neat things. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And I think it's tiny as well. So that was like one of the points why the Preact people loved it. I don't see the sizing anywhere actually, but uh, yeah. So this is the first one we have today. I think we have like three or four more today. <laughs> so let's continue. Uh, yeah, we got React Copyright. This is another uh, immutable state with mutable API thing. Again, uses React. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, come on. Uh, React context API. Thank you. So um, again, you wrap everything into state provider and then whenever you need to consume, you use the state consumer and props, render props. Additional cool features that have this selector thing that allows you to derive values from state and uh, yeah, so it looks it looks quite nice as well. So it's quite similar to unstated, but uh, you know, slightly different with more focus on the context API. So it won't work with older React versions, but uh, seems to be pretty nice actually. Um, you also have this mutate function that you can call to change the state, which is pretty cool. Time to star stuff and never check them again. Yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> All right, next library we have is, or that's not a library actually, that's a tool. It's called Luna and it's an electron based manager for NPM packages with uh, some nice visualizations and uh, nice, like a few features. I, like I'm still a command line person. I still prefer using or doing everything from the command line. But if you like user interfaces, then this looks quite good actually. So do have a look at it. Right. Uh, next thing is Way. It's an open source Slack desktop app that is claims to be very small, very lightweight, and uh, very resource efficient. In, on the contrary to the Slack, that is just abysmally terrible, and I <laughs> freaking hate their app. It's just so bad. Okay, but this one, yeah, it, uh, there was some stats on the data. It was like um, under 50 megabyte or something for seven teams, which is actually incredible. Because Slack eats like 50 megabyte per team at least. So if you're looking for a nice alternative for Slack client, this definitely is a way to go. 
Right, next thing we got the React Static. This is actually not a new library, not a new tool, but I have not seen it before. Uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, TJ uh, posted about it on Twitter. That's why I picked it up. It's a static website generator based on React. Uh, there's a bunch of them, but this one seems to be working really well and really straightforward and, uh, you know, pretty actively developed. So if you are looking for something like this, do have a look at this one. All right, another state management library using React Context. This is all the hype now. As I said, React Context is literally everywhere, along with the props, render props. Um, quite similar API. So you have the state wrapper, right? You have the render props, and then state this time around is just an object, which I guess is nicer than having a class. But uh, again, this is purely dependent on React 16.3, won't work in older versions but it does allow for some pretty cool things. So, you know, if you're, and again, it's two kilobyte, which is also quite impressive actually. So you're looking for um, another state management library, do I have a look at that? Okay, we got uh, a sync optics, a synchronous process and package monitor. This is a um, library that uses the Node.js async and performance hooks to visualize the way that your app works. So if you, you tap it into your app, right? It set up all those hooks, then you use your app, whatever you would. Then you can actually go to this async monitor and see all the function calls, executions, and so on and so forth. And you can actually uh, figure out what the hell happens and maybe, um, you know, for better debugging or performance monitoring. So it's pretty cool. Also have like some fancy visualizations. I have not tried it myself, but it looks um, <coughs> quite useful. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Right, next thing is, I think this already been out for quite some time, but for whatever reason, I did not know about it. It's um, LLDB plugin for Node.js, so C++ bindings. Uh, LLDB is a debugger, so I guess in, under normal circumstances, you wouldn't actually need that, and that's probably why I didn't know about it. But once you hit a snag, once you need to debug the C bit of the node, you know, if you like, if you suspect that there's a bug in a Node.js, then LL notice would be what you would actually use to do that. So it is definitely something I probably should learn at some point, because that seems um, extremely powerful. Like, uh, luckily for me, I never encountered any bugs like this. So I did not had a need to do that yet. I will see how that goes. Right, next thing is Curie. I don't know, Curie, I guess. I guess Curie. Composable SQL query builder using template literals. Um, that is pretty simple. You basically have a, a template literal function called SQL, right? And you can provide other parameters or functions that resolve into uh, strings. So it seems to be pretty flexible and seems to work with like, um, I, like, I don't know. Like the thing is that I am, I'm not sure if I would use that, but it does look pretty interesting. Like, like you know, I just don't have any use cases for that essentially. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So if you, if you, if you are in need of writing SQL queries, uh, composable SQL queries, do have a look at that. It looks pretty nice. All right, next thing is uh, Cytoscape.js. It's um, graph, another graph theory and uh, actually network library for analysis and visualizations of different graphs. So in this case, there is, for example, a really cool uh, Tokyo subway visualization. Uh, let me see, I probably blocked some JavaScript here. Can I please have my network? There we go. So it actually allows you to drag stuff. And the cool thing is, it seems like the library has the integrated path finding. So you could actually just select and it will show, you know, here's the path from one point to another. Seems to be pretty powerful. A lot of different uh, functions, a lot of different uh, ways to animate stuff and uh, graph manipulations positions and dimensions and everything. So essentially it seems to be very similar to D3JS, but only for graphs. So if you're looking for something like this, do have a look. Right, next thing we have is a virtual audiograph. Uh, it's a library for declaratively manipulating web audio API. Uh, if you never try to write web audio API, um, it is quite imperative and might be a bit of a pain in ass to do, but um, 
yeah, this thing essentially provides a declarative abstraction over it. Uh, there is a docs over here. And um, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's a nice abstraction over it. If you prefer writing things declaratively, then you have a look. Hey, fucker, I know. <laughs> you are drunk there, I know. Go celebrate your birthday. Don't hang out in my chat. Okay. Uh, last thing we have is a Viz palette. So this is not exactly a library. This is more a tool for generating a color sets for uh, visualizations. So you can actually just generate a set and then look how it will look on different kind of visualizations to pick the best way, right? So I don't know if it's actually open source or not. It doesn't really look though, so, but um, nonetheless, if you are doing a lot of visualizations, it even has this sort of simulations of color deficiency in a vision. So you can check that people will actually perceive your visualizations correctly, which is kind of amazing. Really cool little tool. Um, if you're doing data viz, do have a look at it. All right, and finally, final thing, which is kind of on a stupid side, I guess not exactly stupid, it's actually very smart, but uh, silly side, let's put it this way. It is not JavaScript related, it's actually written in Golang, I believe, but um, this article talks about encoding data in dubstep drops. <laughs> I don't know why he, um, why the author thought about it, but it is a very in-depth write through on how to do that, like signal processing and all of that stuff. And there's a code in Golang that actually does it. So you can, you know, you, there's even audio samples, obviously. So if you ever wanted to encode secret messages into your dubstep, this is your way to do that. All right, um, that's basically all I have for today. That was a hell of a lot of articles and uh, pretty lengthy um, weekly. So again, if you have any links, any articles, any cool things that I missed or you wanna see on the next weekly, do send them my way. You can do that on YouTube, you can do that in Discord chat, you can do that on Twitter. However, you can contact me. I will be more than happy to have a look at them and add them to the next uh, podcast. That was pretty good. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank you for staying with me as usual. And I guess I'll see you next week. Bye.